So can everyone hear me? I want to get started. I got want to get started because I got, as you can see, I have a lot to cover. And uh, I, I received, I just received an email from uh, Sid Gospy, who apologized for not being here. He said he was sitting in O'Hare Airport, and he said that he might try and see if he can get this by by video connection. So, Sid, if you're there, th thanks, thanks for uh, attending. So, I, I, my title is 150 Years of Neurogenetics. Uh, my disclosure is I receive licensing fees from Athena Diagnostics. The subtitle really should be Back to the Future. I should have brought a clip from that movie. Uh, and what you'll see is I thought a bit about how far back to go, but I'm also going to project things into the future. So it really is uh, Back to the Future. Uh, and so how far back to go? Why did I choose 150 years? The, uh, the occasional familial occurrence of seizures has been known for centuries. It was even mentioned in the Talmud. And uh, Heberden included that observation in his uh, 1802 commentaries. Uh, but I, they, certainly the people millennia ago didn't really understand what we mean by genetics or hereditary. They didn't even know that epilepsy came from the brain, so we're not going to go back that far. And Eberden certainly didn't have an appreciation of a genetics or what we mean by <coughs> uh, inheritance either. So I decided to start 152 years ago with this man, uh, Nicholas uh, Friedreich of Heidelberg. And the reason I chose that is because of the description of the disease that is named after him, Friedreich's ataxia. Uh, and he called it hereditary ataxia. Uh, and he knew it was a spinal cord disease because he had done autopsies and looked at the pathology in the spinal cord. So he knew the disease. He thought it was hereditary. Uh, his clinical observations were accurate, stood the test of time. And what we call Friedreich's ataxia today is what he described 152 years ago. The, uh, the ataxia, the progression, the, uh, the, the, the loss of reflexes, the decreased sensation. The one thing he didn't mention was uh, the often occurrence of Babinski responses. Why not? Babinski hadn't described them. So he couldn't. Uh, and his cases were siblings. That's why he called it uh, hereditary, uh, because he realized that there was something what we now call genetic about this disease. Uh, in 1861, Duchesne had described his disease in a single case. And in 1868, he described 12 more cases of his uh, pseudo hypertrophic muscle disease. Uh, they were all boys. He didn't make too much of that. And surprisingly, none of them were familial. So it's not clear to me that he really understood this was a, a hereditary or familial disease. But he certainly described it very well. And it became a classic of neurogenetics. So I have uh, included it here. He also was into. Uh, electrical stimulation of various neurological problems, which is where this photograph come from. It's the guy standing up that's Duchenne, not the guy that's getting zapped. Uh, and then in 1872, George Huntington described his disease. And I think as many of you know, he was a general practitioner on Long Island. And he was following in the footsteps of his father and his grandfather who were also general practitioners, and they had been following a single family in East Hampton, Long Island, with a progressive severe movement disorder. So George Huntington had the knowledge of the observations of his father and grandfather on this family. And in fact, he recalled uh, going on a buggy uh, home visits with his father to see people in this family with the movement disorder. And he described this disease in 1872. He had just graduated from medical school. He was 22 years old. And that's the only paper he ever wrote. 
So, not bad. <laughs> and his, his description was meticulous. He, was, he described the disease very nicely, and he got the major genetic component. He saw that it was generation after generation. He saw that both males and females were affected, and he saw that if a person didn't have the disease and lived into old age, that person's children and grandchildren were safe and would not inherit the disease. So he was, he was really a, uh, ahead of his time in his description of the disease. He was a, um, a contemporary of Charles Darwin and Gregor Mendel. They didn't have email. So they were all making very pertinent observations that affected each other's ideas, but they didn't communicate them. Uh, although there's documentation that Mendel sent his published paper about inheritance in pea plants to Darwin, who never read it. <laughs> and it's, it's likely that Darwin wouldn't have grasped the significance of it to his ideas uh, in any event, nor would have Huntington had any idea of what a paper about uh, inheritance in pea plants had to do with his disease. But I would like to think that actually Mendel, if he had seen the pedigrees that uh, Huntington and the next generation of physicians produced on Huntington's disease, Mendel would have recognized uh, his inheritance that he was describing in pea plants. Mendel actually did experiments on mice and honeybees as well. Uh, but his abbot made him stop that and throw out those animals because he didn't want such messy, messy things around the, uh, the, uh, the, ab the abbey. So, Tom, we can say with certainty that George Huntington has an H factor of one. Because? Because he has one paper. I thought he had two. But the citations, think of his citation of factor. <laughs> So, uh, this was followed by uh, Charcot, Marie, and Tooth, who described their disease, Charcot, Marie, Tooth disease. It's interesting that Charcot and Marie, and Marie in Paris and Tooth in London described the same disease in the same year, unbeknownst to each other. So, it was, it was a disease whose time had come. And again, their description was very accurate, uh, and they recognized that this had a familial uh, flavor to it. In 1881, also in London, Warren Tay saw an infant dying of a severe progressive brain disease. He was an ophthalmologist and he noticed that what he called the yellow spot of the eye, the macula, had turned red. And so he reported that and just a few years later uh, Bernard Sachs at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City saw infants and children with the same eye phenomenon and he knew that uh, Tay had described this uh, and they had this severe progressive uh, fatal uh, brain disease uh, and he, uh, <coughs> Sachs saw it in siblings in several families and so he knew it was genetic and so he called or hereditary and he called it amurotic familial idiocy. Uh, amurosis meaning loss of vision. And idiocy, by the way, was an accepted academic term. It was a way of describing gradations of, uh, of mental uh, deficiency at the time. We know it as Tay-Sachs disease. So then this man came along, Archibald Garrod uh, in uh, London. And he described a series of conditions that he eventually referred to as inborn errors of metabolism. He was basically a chemist, but he was interested in biological phenomenon and biological phenomenon in humans. Uh, and he found families who were secreting unusual compounds in their urine, many of which changed the urine different colors. And so he documented what the chemical was in the urine and the fact that this was occurring in uh, families. Uh, and so he called them inborn, and, and he also documented that there, were, there seemed to be defects in the metabolic pathway producing these chemicals, and so he called those errors of metabolism. 
that they were born with them, so he referred to them as inborn errors of metabolism. Then his colleague William Bateson came along, uh, and Bateson was an interesting guy who is considered one of the first, if not the first, human geneticists. Uh, and he actually coined the term genetics. It had never been used before. And he referred to the study of familial diseases as a study of genetics. And Mendel's uh, experiments in pea plants had just been rediscovered. Uh, and Bateson and his colleagues were studying those. And Bateson had the, the insight to look at family pedigrees that physicians were producing of familial diseases and thinking about these pedigrees in terms of what Mendel had described in pea plants. And Bateson had the insight to say the inheritance that Mendel is describing in pea plants is happening in human beings. And he used Huntington's disease as his example of dominance. He said Huntington's disease in humans is the equivalent of tall in pea plants that Mendel was describing, a dominant genetic trait. I mean, that seems so simple and straightforward to us. It was an incredible uh, leap of insight uh, in Bateson to take pea plant inheritance and apply it to human disease. He also went further and said the inborn errors of metabolism that my friend Garad is reporting are recessive, like, like small, short, in Mendel's pea plants. Amazing. Really, really a remarkable insight. In fact, Bateson named his son Gregory after Gregor Mendel. So uh, a lot was going on in genetics uh, in, in uh, England and Great Britain at the time. This person is little known, but she really was quite remarkable. Her name was Julia Bell. And you can see that she lived to be just shy of 100 years old. Uh, and she was like Bateson. And she wanted to, discover, to uh, investigate families with hereditary <laughs> genetic diseases. And she took it upon herself to try and discover every family in England with an inherited uh, genetic disease, document them and draw their pedigrees. And she went a long way toward doing that. She, she uh, published these books called The Treasury of Human Inheritance over a period of almost 50 years. The UW Medical Library has most of these. I've seen them. They're, they're big folio volumes, thousands of pages. Uh, and she drew the pedigrees of all these people and because the neurologic diseases were relatively common and remarkable, uh, most of the uh, diseases she studied were neurologic. She looked, she looked at Friedreich's ataxia, myotonic muscular dystrophy, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, um, uh, uh, Huntington's disease, uh, limb girdle muscular dystrophy, spastic paraplegia. She documented all the families with those. and. She looked at prevalence, she looked at frequency, she looked at fertility rates, she looked at male versus female uh, uh, patterns, uh, and she looked at mode of inheritance, uh, dominant recessive. And by then, X-linked inheritance was underst understood, so she looked at that too. So really quite remarkable. I call her the first neurogenetic uh, epidemiologist. So now I'm, going to, I'm just going to review a list that I have put together of some of the major happenings since that time uh, in neurogenetics. And I start here with what was going on in the 50s and 60s. And in 1948, a pathologist in uh, the UK discovered that it was copper that was accumulating in the brain and in the liver of patients with Wilson's disease. Uh, and in 1951, just three years later, uh, Derek Denny Brown in Boston, for some reason, knew about this, uh, this chemical compound called BAL. And it turns out that that stands for British Anti-Lewisite. And he gave that to some patients with Wilson's disease in Boston, and they improved. Uh, and the reason he gave it to them, because he knew it chelated heavy metals. It chelated copper. 
and it actually worked in these patients. British anti-lewisite. It turns out lewisite was an arsenic compound that was developed during World War I to use a light mustard gas as a biological poison. And so the Brits in World War II thought that the Germans were going to use this, and so they developed a chemical that would chelate arsenic out of the body, and they call it British anti-lewisite. And it turned out that not only did it chelate arsenic, but it also chelated copper. And it worked. So a severe autosomal recessive neurologic disease was being treated by a chemical approach. And the same thing happened again a few years later with uh, phenylketonuria, PT, PKU. It was uh, discovered what the uh, defect was in PKU. It turned out to be an inborn error of metabolism. Uh, and if you manipulated the diet to prevent people from, young people from getting uh, phenylketon ketones in their uh, body, you could prevent the development of the disease. Uh, Phil, do you still see your patient with PKU? No, I haven't. What was her age? She was in her 70s? Yes, 60s, I think. So, Phil, Dr. Phil Swanson has seen a follow-up patient for years here at the university who was an early case of PKU who was not treated, isn't that right? Because she was born before this era, uh, and she has developed all these severe end-stage manifestations of PKU. Uh, and the inborn mirrors of metabolism got looked at very carefully. Uh, the uh, uh, sulfatide excess in metachromatic leukodystrophy, uh, the identification of GM2 storage in Tay-Sachs disease, uh, the deficiency of aryl sulfatase A and metachromatic leukodystrophy, these were all described in the 50s uh, and 60s. And also notice that uh, in 1959, tri trisomy 21 Down syndrome was finally shown to be a, uh, an excess of uh, a chromosome 21. Uh, so uh, some uh, pretty amazing things happened in the 50s and 60s, and I think of it as the era of biochemical uh, neurogenetics. Uh, when I started training, there was this book that was published in 1967 by a a British neurologist called RTC Pratt, The Genetics of Neurological Disorders. It was a marvelous book, and it reviewed basically everything that had happened in clinical neurogenetics for the previous 100 years. It wasn't a terribly long book, <laughs> but it was very good. It, uh, it referenced a huge amount of literature, and a re most remarkable, almost all the articles in there I could find in the uh, UW Medical School Library. We have an incredible uh, library in terms of, uh, in terms of its, uh, uh, it, its catalog. And of course, things changed dramatically in 1953 by these people, Watson, Crick, Wilson, and Wilkins, and Franklin, who uh, documented what DNA really uh, was uh, composed of in terms of its uh, structure and the, the uh, recognition of how genes were put together and how uh, changes in these genes might cause uh, diseases uh, and how uh, DNA was coding for a protein. So, so a huge uh, change in our way of thinking about uh, genetic diseases and certainly neurogenetic diseases. Uh, but the findings of uh, Watson and Crick didn't really impact medical genetics or medical neurogenetics for several decades. The technology had to uh, catch up with what they had discovered. In the 1970s, uh, linkage was still going on, trying to find where in the human genome diseases resided physically genetically. Where were the genes for these diseases? Even though a gene had never been seen and the concept of what a gene was was not even, not even clear. In 1971, because there were lots of families with myotonic dystrophy, it was linked to the Lutheran and ABH secretor mark markers, uh, which could be measured in any blood bank. Clearly linkage existed, and it was known that these markers were inherited. The problem was no one knew the, the chromosomal location of any of those markers. 
So myotonic dystrophy had a linkage relationship, but no one still knew where it was in the human genome. In 76, dopa responsive dystonia was shown to be responsive to L-dopa. L-dopa had just been uh, uh, become a treatment for Parkinson's disease around 1970, uh, and uh, an a, a, a neurologist in Japan recognize that this rare autosomal recessive disease movement disorder could be totally reversed and basically cured by L-dopa if the patients maintained a low dose for the rest of their life. Uh, the first cerebellar ataxia, and so it's called SCA1, was linked to the HLA locus and the chromosomal location of HLA was then known it was on the short arm of chromosome 6, so a neurogenetic disease had been linked to a specific region on a specific human chromosome for the first time. We, here at the UW, got into this uh, phenomenon at about that time, and I wanted to uh, briefly go into our first uh, family study using the technology of the 1970s. The idea here was to start with a, a patient with a neurogenetic disease to find the family and get other family members and determine who had the disease and who didn't, collect blood from them, use markers across the human genome looking for linkage to do a statistical linkage analysis of the disease with the various markers. And then at that time, you couldn't find a gene, but the, the proposition was that this would eventually, sometime in the future, lead to the identification of a gene, which would tell you what the protein was that was involved, and then you could manipulate the protein to treat the patient in some way. So that was the cycle that everybody had uh, in mind. In order to do this, you needed a team, you needed a clinician, you needed a pathologist if there was a pathological phenotype, you needed a statistical geneticist who could do the linkage analysis, uh, and you would eventually need a molecular biologist to identify the gene, or maybe a protein chemist to identify the protein, uh, and to try and figure out the actual mechanism of the disease. But in fact, you only needed the first three people in the 1970s. So we started with uh, this person. Let's see if I can get this to go. So this young lady uh, has Charcot-Marie Tooth disease, and you'll see her foot drop as she walks. You can see the classic uh, foot drop as she goes across the uh, studio room. And this is her family. Uh, she's in that uh, third generation, and by bad luck, of the six siblings, five of them had charcoal tooth, and their father had charcoal tooth, and their grandmother had charcoal tooth, and one of them had a child with charcoal tooth, and they were all alive because it's not a fatal disease. So it was a perfect disease to study genetic linkage in because you could do, uh, in this case, four generations with lots of affected people, and you could also determine who was unaffected. So we got blood samples from all these people. Uh, my colleague at the time was a, a fellow here by the name of Jurg Ott. We ran genetic blood markers with uh, Elo Giblet, who ran the Seattle Blood Bank. Uh, and here's the neat part, uh, Ellen. You know how many markers we had? Uh, do you have one on each No. Uh, <laughs> we, we had 12. We had 12. We had 12 markers. None of them were DNA. They were blood group markers. So we were covering the whole human genome with 12 markers. <laughs> Don't do that. You shouldn't do that. That, was, <laughs> that, that made, almost, it made almost no sense. But we got a positive linkage to the Duffy blood group. And this was different from what happened in myotonic dystrophy because Duffy was known to be on chromosome 1. The reason it was known to be on chromosome 1 was because it was linked to a chromosomal abnormality called uncoiler. 
that you could see under the microscope. And the linkage was discovered by a fellow in medical genetics here who, because he was a fellow, had to do his own karyotype. And he found the uncoiler locus in his karyotype. And he got blood samples from his family and could trace the uncoiler locus, which was perfectly benign through his family. Uh, and to do a, I think for a master's thesis, uh, he did a genetic linkage study with the blood group markers. And he found the uncoiler locus in his family was linked to the Duffy locus. So when we found the linkage to Duffy, we knew it was on chromosome 1. Um, and we reported this in 1980 uh, at the uh, Human Genetics Society meetings in uh, New York City. To carry this on, and I'll, we're now progressing beyond what my previous slides showed, but eventually in 1993, so 13 years later, uh, an investigator, a neuroscientist in Japan discovered that a, a, an important peripheral myelin protein called myelin P0, the gene for it was on the exact region on chromosome uh, 1 where we had reported the linkage to Duffy in our family. Of course, it was a peripheral nerve disease, so he asked for samples from our family, which we sent him, and he found a mutation in myelin P0 in this family with sharp armor tooth disease. So it was one of the uh, demonstrations of a mutation of a specific gene causing uh, sharp armor tooth. And uh, this is the, the three major genes that cause sharp armor tooth. You can see that, uh, see if I can find, so this is uh, myelin P0, and it's called CMT1B. This is peripheral myelin protein 22. It causes mutations in it cause CMT1A. And this is connexin 32, and mutations in it cause an X-linked form of sharp memory tooth because the gene for connexin 32 is on the X chromosome. So to carry this further, there's some understanding about what's wrong with the myelin P0 protein. Uh, at least one of the mutations in it causes the protein to be retained in the endoplasmic reticulum. It elicits an unfolded protein response. It doesn't get out of the ER, so my peripheral myelin is not formed properly, and it causes a demyelinating peripheral hereditary neuropathy. Uh, there's no cure for it, although in the mouse model of MPZ mutations, there has been a report of curcumin improving the uh, disease. So stay tuned. There have been attempts to try and treat uh, human CMT1B patients with this agent. The point being that we've tried to go around this whole circle. We've gone from that patient to her family, to collecting material, to doing a linkage study, to finding the linkage on the long arm of chromosome 1, to identifying the gene, to finding the protein, to coming up with ideas how to treat the disease. The cycle is working. Very cool. <coughs> Garad and Mendel would be delighted. So in 1980, when we reported this linkage, uh, Botstein, uh, White, and Skolnick in Utah published this paper saying, you guys who are using blood group markers trying to cover the whole human genome with 11 markers are out to lunch. What you need to be using is pieces of DNA. And if you fragment DNA and cut it up into little pieces and identify what chromosome region it's on, you can get hundreds and then thousands of pieces of DNA. And you can use those to do your linkage studies, and you'll have a lot more luck. And they call these RFLPs, restriction fragment length polymorphisms. And that changed the whole uh, story of uh, looking for human uh, disease genes. Uh, and so in 1983, investigators were able to find the location of the gene causing Huntington's disease using these RFLP DNA markers. It was one of the first major uh, positive results from using those uh, DNA markers. And it was located on the very, very distal uh, end of chromosome 4P. Soon after that, the gene was found for Duchenne muscular dystrophy and neurofibromatosis type 1. Uh, and then 
people in the UK found mitochondrial mutations in uh, mitochondrial diseases. These were deletions of uh, mitochondrial DNA. Uh, Stan Prusner and his group found mutations in the prion gene causing Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. Uh, and this was a huge benefit to Prusner and his hypotheses because people were being very critical of this idea that prions could be causing uh, uh, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease and Kuru, for example. Uh, and what was the real proof of that? How do you know it wasn't some slow virus that was mixed in and you were missing it? Uh, and so what was demonstrated was that prions were a normally occurring brain protein, that we had a gene that produces a prion, and then there are families that have point mutations in that gene, and if they have that, they develop the disease. And they don't need a slow virus, they don't need anything else, it's just a point mutation in the prion gene, and that's it. You get the disease. So it made a huge uh, difference in, um, uh, in the proof that prions were involved in this disease. And uh, Claire, excuse my misspelling. So Bruce, the 1990s, I say, are the beginning of the golden age of neurogenetics because of all of this that had been accumulating and bubbling up from the surface for the past uh, hundred years. Uh, and things happened very rapidly. The channelopathy genes were discovered. Mutations causing Alzheimer's disease were discovered. Uh, and a whole new paradigm was found, the trinucleotide repeat diseases. The first two were Fragile X mutation, and the, at the exact same year, uh, X-linked spinal bulbar muscular atrophy uh, the uh, trinucleotide repeat causing that was found by Al Laspada and Kurt Fishbeck at the University of Pennsylvania. And Al Laspada was just here a few weeks ago telling us about that. Uh, and these were amazing new kinds of problems in genes that had never been anticipated, never thought about before. And that led people to finally discover the gene for Huntington's disease. Remember I told you the linkage for Huntington's was found in 83. And this was a decade later, 10 years later, they still hadn't found the gene. It was way out on the end of the chromosome. There was almost no DNA around it. They knew exactly where it must be, and they couldn't find a mutation in it. And that's because it wasn't a traditional mutation. It was a polyglutamine repeat expansion. Uh, and they looked for that, and boom, there it was uh, in the Huntington gene. Uh, the association of APOE4 with Alzheimer's disease was found. The two other genes for Alzheimer's were found. Uh, the first gene for uh, genetic epilepsy was found uh, in uh, nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy. And Nicholas Friedreich had his day uh, 133 years later. The cause of the uh, Friedreich's ataxia gene was discovered, and it also is a repeat expansion, but it's an autosomal recessive uh, repeat expansion. Alpha synuclein mutations were found in Parkinson's disease, tau and FTD, Parkinson mutations in Parkinson's, uh, the genetic defect in Rett's disease. So the 1990s were uh, an amazingly uh, fruitful time. And it hasn't stopped. Uh, it's, it's continued. Uh, there's now enzyme replacement therapy of uh, acid maltase uh, for Pompe's disease. The Human Genome Project was completed in 2000. Uh, the splicing problem in uh, uh, myotonic muscular dystrophy has been found. A mutation in a glial protein has been found calling, causing Alexander's disease. Um, there have been attempts to treat Alzheimer's disease with uh, uh, amyloid vaccinations to remove the plaque, and that's a whole new concept. Uh, a triplication of the alpha synuclein gene has been shown to cause Parkinson's disease in some families. And it's not a point mutation. It's not a mutation. It's simply a triplication. Just like Down syndrome is a triplication of chromosome 21, you can have triplications of small regions of chromosomes. And if they happen to uh, contain a gene that results in protein accumulation, you may have a disease just from the triplication the duplication of that genetic area, and that's happened in Parkinson's disease. It's also happened, by the way, in uh, the amyloid gene in Alzheimer's disease. 
progranulin mutations were found in FTD, uh, and then uh, a, a, a therapeutic approach to tuberous sclerosis was found uh, to have an, an inhibitor of mTOR as a therapy for the tubers and tuberous sclerosis in 2006. Um, the mid 2000 uh, and so were also the era of GWASs, genome wide association studies. And you, as you know, hundreds of those have been done, many of them for neurologic diseases like stroke, multiple sclerosis, autism, ALS, Parkinson's disease, uh, Alzheimer's disease. A great deal has been found, there's a huge amount of data. Exactly where it's leading us is, uh, is not so clear. And the C9 ORF. 72 expansion causing the combination of ALS and frontotemporal dementia was discovered just a few years ago. And we've had Jeff Rothstein and Ian McKenzie here giving us grand rounds about that. It is the, the most common genetic cause of uh, ALS uh, and frontotemporal dementia. And now, more recently, we've entered the era of doing exome sequencing for genetic testing. And that's changed the clinical approach to uh, the neurogenetic families. Uh, and let me show you this patient. So this is a patient that was seen by uh, Dr. Swanson in genetics clinic and then referred to uh, Dr. Uh, Hisama in medical genetics. And she's an 18 year old girl with a movement disorder. And we've called it a combination of Korea and dystonia. It's episodic because she has period where she doesn't have these movements at all. So Dr. Hassan, Dr. Hassan, are you here? So you said, looks genetic to me. Let's see if we can find out where the mutation is. And so you sent off for whole exome sequencing, right? Actually, what I said was, this is a, a girl who had been seen in about nine different medical centers up and down the West Coast and into Texas, and no one had ever been able to figure out what she had. And she had had a list of prior testing as long as you're on, including considerable genetic testing. So I said, I know what you don't have, and I'm not going to send genetic testing for things that I know that you don't have. So I said, I think I will send this, um, and we'll see what happens. And I think this is actually the first exome that I ordered. So you were one for, you were one for one. <laughs> so this is the report from her whole exome sequencing, and I don't expect you to read it, but there are a couple of important points to make here. The first is that they found a missense variant in a gene, and they could identify the gene, and they said it's the ADCY5 adenylate cyclase gene, and there's a variant that is a, an amino acid substitution, uh, W for R at codon 418. And so the question was, so what? Is that pathogenic or is that benign? And the lab very nicely reviewed the literature on ADCY5. Have there ever, any mutations ever been described in this gene? And they very nicely said in their report that the answer was yes. There was a 2002 paper, 12 paper, that just came out the year before, right, or so, describing mutations in this gene causing a movement disorder that looked like chorea and dystonia. So they said, we think that may be important. The other thing to notice is that there's a huge amount of data. This is only one page of the report. And these exome studies are like, you know, the old, the old concept of trying to get a drink of water from a fire hose. You get a huge amount of data, all kinds of genetic variants may be found, and trying to figure out what's a normal variant and what's a pathogenic variant causing the disease can be very difficult. In this case, it turned out that it was easy because that 
Chan et al. paper was published by the people just around the corner from the clinic, our group, we had a family with a movement disorder where uh, uh, Dong Wei Chen and Wendy Raskin in their lab had found a mutation in the gene causing the movement disorder in this family. Uh, and Wendy, I think, is going to talk more about this tomorrow in Medical Genetics Grand, Round, Grand Rounds. And in fact, this young 18-year-old woman became a subject in our recent paper that we've just published on the, the overview of uh, a large number of patients and families who have mutations in this gene. So the exome sequencing business uh, really works. She, of course, had no family history. She had no family history. So she was a new mutation. And she was also what's called mosaic. Not all of her cells have the mutation. Uh, and Wendy, I think, will have a lot more to say about that tomorrow. So that brings us right up to date. That's 152 years from Friedrichs and his ataxia. And so what I want to do is take a few minutes and see if I can go back to the future and tell you what I think the future uh, looks like. So I think 50 years from now, we will have more than 2,000 genes associated with uh, diseases of the central and peripheral nervous system that we have actually identified. Uh, and that we will need to develop a better understanding of things like selective neuronal vulnerability. Why in Huntington's disease is it the median spiny neurons of the caudate that are affected? Why not the other neurons? Why does this polyglutamine repeat expansion primarily initially affect the median spiny neurons? Uh, we need to figure that out. And what about these interesting protein aggregation diseases, prion diseases, amyloid diseases, alpha-synuclein and Lewy bodies that can be generated by mutations in genes? How is it that uh, these are causing protein uh, aggravation, aggregation? And what can we do about it? Uh, what about uh, epigenetic phenomenon in chromatin? What about mitochondrial diseases of the nervous system? We need to, they're quite common. We need to learn a lot more about them. And what about genetic factors in embryological development? We just had a talk last week in medical genetics on something called mTORopathies. So mutations in genes around the mTOR protein cause a wide variety of uh, pediatric childhood uh, brain abnormalities. Uh, and what about these GWAS studies that, that have been done? We now know uh, that have been reported 12 different risk genes for Alzheimer's <laughs> disease. I mean, so what? What, what, what can we make of that? Uh, and it may turn out to be very important. There have been attempts to do what's called uh, convergence of these multiple genes, looking for are they affecting certain pathways more than others. And for in Alzheimer's disease, these genes suggest the immune response pathway, lipid transport pathways, and uh, proteins involved with ubiquitination. <coughs> so it may be that these GWAS studies and the multiple genes that are found will actually be helpful in our understanding the uh, biochemical pathways involved in these uh, diseases. And what about gene environment interactions? I'm a geneticist. I think everything is genetic, but of course that's not true. Uh, environment has a great deal to do with it. There's a huge amount of variability, and a lot of that must come from the environment. But what in the environment? Viruses, toxins, chemical compounds, the weather, uh, uh, who, who knows what. But those things must be important, uh, and the interactions with these gen genetic disease need to be worked out. Uh, and what about the role of glial cells? We know there can be mutations in glial cell proteins that can cause genetic diseases, but what about their interactions with uh, genetic diseases and the response of glial cells to those diseases? And the role of mosaicism, that 18-year-old girl I just showed you, I mentioned she's mosaic. She doesn't have the mutation uh, in uh, every cell in her body. How did that come about? Uh, what does it mean? Uh, and how important is that in the variability we see in genetic disease? And it's beginning to look like it's extremely important. And it probably has, mosaicism probably has a great deal to do with the huge variability uh, that we see in genetic diseases. 
So in the next 50 years, there's going to be a lot of talk about genetic testing. There are going to be more tests. There's going to be better availability of them. The expense is coming down. There will be a greater use of things like pre-implantation diagnosis. There will be test panels. And as you've already seen, whole uh, exome sequencing. The tough thing is separating the benign variants from the pathogenic variants. Here, for example, is a panel for Charcot-Marie Tooth disease. This is something like 48 genes that you can now ask to be analyzed in someone you think has Charcot-Marie Tooth. But in fact, there's one or two genes that cause the vast bulk of this disease, so those really ought to be looked at first before you go on to all the others. And that's the way a lot of the labs are approaching this. They're doing this in a uh, sequential stage uh, sort of manner. Uh, and uh, Mike Dorster is here in the, in the front row. And he has a lab that's called the Northwest Clinical Genomics Laboratory. Uh, and he has developed a set of panels for some very interesting and important uh, neurogenetic diseases. This is the number of genes that his lab can do for the comprehensive dementia Parkinson's ALS panel. All your favorite genes for those diseases are on that panel and probably some you've never heard of. The panels can also be subcategorized in order so that you can order just a dementia panel. You can order just an ALS gene panel. You can order just a Parkinson's disease panel. Uh, and many more like these will be uh, coming forward uh, in the uh, next few uh, weeks and months, actually. In the next 50 years, there are going to be much better treatments for neurogenetic diseases. We saw that dopa-responsive dystonia, small amounts of L-dopa can essentially eliminate uh, a, a quite severe neurologic disease. We need more examples like that. Diet can basically cure uh, phenylketonuria. Another disease somewhat like that, there's a riboflavin transporter genetic defect that's been described, and just giving the children riboflavin greatly uh, improves the disease. Stem cells may become important treatments for genetic diseases. We just had a grand rounds by Eva Feldman on injecting stem cells into the spinal cord of people with uh, ALS. But we have to watch out for stem cell tourism. There's a very nice editorial in the most recent issue of JAMA Neurology on stem cell tourism. People are going to uh, Germany and Mexico and China to get their stem cell treatments for their MS and ALS and uh, Alzheimer's disease. And at the moment, it doesn't work, and they're wasting a lot of money. We may be able to actually alter genes to treat these diseases. And maybe the new uh, CRISPR uh, technology is a, a step in that direction. And don't ask me to explain CRISPR technology. There are people in the room who can explain it much better than I can, although I know what the letters stand for. So precision medicine, uh, trying to tailor treatments for specific <coughs> genetic diseases, will, be, will we be able to knock down uh, the mutations causing diseases like Huntington's disease and not affect the, uh, the normal gene or other genes. And will, will different genetic forms of the same syndrome require different treatments? How many kinds of Alzheimer's disease are there? Is the genetic form of Alzheimer's disease caused by a presenol one mutation, is that a different disease from the Alzheimer's disease that we see in people in their 80s in the nursing home. And if they're different diseases, will they need different treatments? Or is there a final common pathway where you can use the treatment to approach both those kinds of individuals? And we don't know the answer to that at, at, the, at the moment. Will we be able to reverse some of these uh, protein aggregation diseases by actually removing the aggregated protein from the brain? Can, we will be able to deliver treatments directly to the cells that are involved, directly to the medium spiny neurons of the caudate and Huntington's disease, directly to glial cells, to 
the Schwann cells and the peripheral nerves of Charcot Marie Tooth patients to the to the muscles in patients with Duchenne uh, muscular dystrophy. Will we be able to prevent the disease in carriers of the abnormal gene before they ever develop the disease? This is the point of what's called the Diane study that's uh, headquartered at uh, Washington University in St. Louis, but it's uh, sites all over the world, including here at the UW, to take people who are in their 30s and 40s who we know have inherited the mutations for Alzheimer's disease because it's in their families and one of their parents has died with it. They've got the mutation. They're going to develop Alzheimer's disease and treating them before they have any symptoms. Is that the way to pre prevent the disease? Because it's too late when the protein has already aggregated in their brains. The Diane study is typical of a study that's going to try and answer of that question. Won't that be remarkable? What about the classification of these diseases? Something quite simple, but it's driving everybody nuts. It was easy, SCA1, the linkage was first found, and then there was two, three, and four, that's okay. Now there's 38, 39, and 40. I defy anybody in the room to tell me what SCA38 is. You don't know, but there's too many. There's too many forms of these diseases. Uh, Friedreich would be amazed. Type 2 Charcomery tooth, the letters associated with it, you know, the kind we found was CMT1B. Well, in CMT2, the axonal form of Charcomery tooth, there's 2A, 2B, 2C, 2D, 2E, and it keeps right on going out to U. So what's CMT2M? No one knows. But Parkinson's disease, it goes out to Parkinson, Parkinson 17. So the, the consensus is to forget about the letters and numbers uh, and use the genes that have been discovered or the proteins or the linkage uh, relationship. So SCA14 should be called spinal cerebellar ataxia PKC gamma related. CMT2A should be CMT2 mitofusin related. PARC8 should be Parkinson's disease, LARC2 related. And that's more concise, it's more meaningful, and it connects the disease to the genes and the proteins that are involved. In the next 50 years, we need to educate the public more about neurogenetic diseases. We also need to educate physicians and the providers this stuff has gotten really complicated and complex. Nobody can learn it all. And so a great deal of, uh, of education and understanding needs to go on. Uh, I think neurogenetics will eventually become a subspecialty. And we need genetic counselors who know about neurologic diseases. Because all of these diseases, are tests are being developed for them. Whether or not you want the test, and what's available, and how to interpret it. There need to be healthcare providers who can help you with that, and that's what genetic counselors to do. A lot of genetic counselors are pediatric trained or uh, perinatal trained, and they can't counsel people with Huntington's disease. So we need to have genetic counselors who know about neurogenetics, particularly about adult neurogenetic diseases. Uh, and finally, I think we're going to find out more about the genetic control and impact of some human behavior that we don't think too much about in terms of genetic language, uh, depression and bi bipolar disease, schizophrenia, cognition, intellect, uh, drug and alcohol addiction, violence. I'm certain there are strong genetic components in all of those things. They're not the only thing. Environment is important. Social factors are important. Diet is important. But genes play a role, and I think it should be eventually helpful to know what those genes are and what the role is that they're playing. So the reason we can look into the future is because we stand on the shoulders of giants. And that quote was attributed to Isaac Newton uh, in one of his writings in 1676, but it turns out he stole it from a guy named Bernard of Chartres who, uh, who actually said it uh, in the 12th century. But they're right. And these are the 
giants that I've been talking about. And I think that's why the future of neurogenetics is going to be so fascinating and so exciting. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. So the young Chris. woman with the ABCY5 mutation, um, how was it recognized that she had a mosaicism and was her phenotype at all different from the familial case that, that was described? So the question is what about the mosaicism in that 18 year old girl with the ADCY5 uh, mutation? It was actually reported in the lab report. I didn't highlight it, but they actually said that when they looked at the, uh, the mutation in their, their chromograph, basically, the, the height of the uh, amino acid was not what you would expect. It was a different height, and they actually hypothesized that there was mosaicism. And Wendy Raskin is going to tell you a lot more about that uh, tomorrow. Actually, the exome report said that there were unequal reads. Can't read the number of And we have we have what six or seven people now that are mosaic. Yeah, we have a lot. Of so a bunch of people are mosaic for this, and the answer is yes, they do seem to be less severely affected. In fact, we have one individual who was reported in the neurological literature forty some years ago by the people here in our EEG department as having a movement disorder, an episodic movement movement disorder that was quite severe. And we now have followed her over the next 40 some years, and her disease has gotten better and better and better. And now at age 65, her exam is normal. She was reported because it was so remarkable 40 years ago. And she is mosaic for one of these ADCY5 mutations. And her children and grandchildren have severe disease. Do you have to be a, a new mutation to be mosaic? Yes. Yeah, because it, it happens uh, post fertilization. Um, yeah, my nice. Um, so, I had a question for you about when is it appropriate to do genetic testing when there isn't a treatment that could be effective that could be, be utilized to treat the patient. And, and this has come up recently in, in ALS with the discovery C9 org. So, I get asked this question a lot from patients who have a sporadic appearance appearing in the form of ALS and then they're late, late life. And they know their, their family history pretty well, so it's pretty clear they don't have a family history of ALS. And they ask me, I have kids, should I get genetic testing? And in the past, I would say, well, most patients with sporadic ALS, or most ALS is sporadic, and if there's no family <coughs> history and you're, and you're presenting late in life, there's no reason to do it. But now we know that, as you know, that up to a little bit more than 10% of all sporadic ALS, you can identify gene mutation. So the question is, should we be doing genetic testing in all patients with sporadic ALS at this point? Right, so to summarize, the question is, when do you do genetic testing? <laughs> uh, and on the, it's quite complicated, uh, and I, that's why I think we need people who know all the aspects and ins and outs of genetic testing and the pros and cons because there are a lot of pros and cons. 
And one piece of this is when you do genetic testing for somebody who has symptomatic disease and you're trying to use it to make a diagnosis. Uh, and another is when do you do gen genetic testing in people who are asymptomatic in the families who are at risk but don't have the disease but you know they're at risk for it because of their family history. The specific example you gave of the CNA ORF in ALS is very complicated because it's relatively common in sporadic cases. So you have this issue of how often do you do the testing in sporadic cases. Uh, and if it's 5 or 10 percent, is that high enough to make you want to do it? And then you have to stop and ask, why? Why would you want to do it? And there's no cure for ALS. So you're certainly not doing it looking for cure. But you can come up with a whole list of reasons why you might want to do it, as well as a whole list of reasons why you might not want to. Reasons that you might want to are, for example, there are going to be treatment trials that are focused on people with specific genetic mutations. And so this person won't be eligible for that treatment trial unless you know what their genetic mutation is. So that sometimes comes up, and I think it's going to come up quite a bit in ALS because people with an SOD1 mutation won't be eligible for the same kind of studies that C9 ORFs are. So, so that's one reason. Uh, another is, are my children and grandchildren at risk for this disease that I've got? Am I a sporadic case or do we know it's genetic? So, so if the children and grandchildren want to know, that would be another reason you might want to do it. But with this particular gene, there are huge questions about the penetrance. Can you have the mutation and not ever develop the disease. And it looks like at least sometimes you can. So that becomes very difficult to explain to that who are at risk for it in the family. So it's quite complicated. And there's also the things about insurance. If you make a genetic diagnosis in people, uh, they may not be, who are asymptomatic. They may not be eligible for long-term care insurance or health insurance. So you've got to be very careful about testing people beforehand. But there are lots of people that want to know, lots of people don't want to know. You need to give them the spreadsheet and talk about all the pros and cons and then let them decide. Yes, Hannah. That's a question and a lament probably, but I've gone through that process with many patients and most of the time families, these are female patients, most of the time families want to know and a lot of it is the end of the diagnostic odyssey. None of those very persuasive reasons that you just listed have ever been enough to convince an insurance company that you need to test them. And then running to this thing where there's like this huge disconnect between what I think is worthwhile yes. and the patient and family. And then the insurance company said, oh, spare that all now. So yes. So change management too. But the very narrow definition of what's going to be Right. The whole issue of insurance companies paying for this is a, it's a very big issue. And they are using the smokescreen excuse that it's experimental. And that's because 30 years ago it was. <laughs> and it's not anymore. And they don't care, the insurance companies, they don't want to hear that because it would change uh, the necessity to pay for it. But they need to be convinced that it is uh, diagnostic. It's not all that different from getting an MRI in somebody with headaches, right? Uh, and so, uh, so you, you can have a lot of negatives, but you can get a positive that makes all the difference in the world. So insurance companies need to learn that. I think they're going to eventually because these are becoming much more common. The cost is going down, and the labs that do them and the patients that want them, I think, are uh, lobbying to get that change. But right now, we're in, era, in an era where it's very difficult, very frustrating for everyone. Yes? What about direct to consumer genetic testing? What about what about direct to consumer genetic testing? Uh, I, I I don't rec I don't recommend it, but people do it, and uh, it, it it's for some people it's kind of a parlor game, and you can find out your genetic risk of having earwax. <laughs> Uh, that the companies make mistakes. You know, 23 and me, you and me got shut down by the FDA a couple of years ago because they had made uh, technological mistakes, uh, and they they are staying away from largely doing disease-related Mendelian diseases, and they tend to do risk factor kinds of things, which are softer, uh, and they may change your risk for something from one percent to two percent. 
and then they tell you that your risk has increased. But of course, one percent to two percent is meaningless for the patient. But that's the kind of thing that goes on. So there's a soft counter argument to uh, uh, to the resistance to uh, consumer initiated uh, genetic testing. That's simply expense. Uh, if things are done well, and you can do them well, uh, and on a wide scale, the price plummets; it drops dramatically. Trying to get genetic testing on almost anything in a patient through a patient uh, typical forum is a very expensive proposition uh, and often daunting and frequently not reimbursed. But but direct to consumer testing and genetic testing for these diseases is apples and oranges. It, it they're, is. They're, they're not the same. It is, but you, you can't do twenty. You can't do twenty three and me and find out if you have Huntington's disease. Tom, I'm not talking about anything existing, but I'm talking yes. about somebody deciding to say you have a movement disorder. I can take and test very cheaply because I've done it on a grand scale uh, for the same things and just as well mm -hmm. uh, as the Mayo Clinic or wherever that might be. Yeah, yeah. So, so Mike, do you think that's the case? Is the, is the price going to continue to go down and down for these uh, uh, disease genetic testing panels? Yeah, but never to the level of 23andMe. Yeah. Not if you want a real clinical interpretation mm -hmm. uh, behind it. And we're not looking for variants that are associated result in a risk change, we're looking for the actual variant that causes the disease. Yeah. And there's a question from Mario. Uh, Mario in Peru. Mario's in Lima, Peru. Hey, Mario, thanks for the, thanks for the question. Uh, and he does it in English. Because he does, I, doesn't, I don't speak Spanish. Congratulations for a great talk from Neurogenetic Team in Peru. What about evolution of neurogenetics training? Any thoughts about how to improve it? So, uh, I mean, that was part of the education thing I was talking about. I think our residents and our medical students need to learn all this stuff that I've been talking about. The most recent stuff especially, I think they need to know the history stuff because I think it's fascinating and it gives you a theme for how this has developed. I mean, Friedreich and Duchesne and Sharp Henri and, and Tooth were very smart guys, but they didn't have this technology. But what they observed and what they described was state of the art and they did it very well and they're the giants whose uh, shoulders we are on. But Genetic testing is going to be so important in the practice of medicine that this has to be part of the education of our uh, students and residents. And for neurologists, the neurogenetic piece is very important. Yes? As you went through the history, you talked about sort of a handful of things that once we figured them out, we gained a lot more knowledge rapidly, the double helix and SNPs and red flips, red flips and PCI. What's, what's something that we can't do easily now that seems like we should? So you're probably asking the wrong person because I'm not into the technology. But from, uh, but from your perspective, what, you know, what, what's, the, what's the next thing in terms of? So, so I think I think the genetic test the genetic testing needs to be easier uh, and cheaper and easier to interpret. The huge problem with genetic testing is the interpretation. When you get a DNA change, how do you know? whether it's pathologic and causing what you're looking at in, in the patient in the clinic or it's just a normal variant. Uh, and the people doing the testing don't know because what that requires is thousands and thousands of normal control background samples from lots of different ethnic groups because there may be variability. Mario seeing a, a, a Native American Indian patient in Peru may find very different variants from what we find in our clinic in Seattle. So you've got to know that kind of background too. So the interpretation of these genetic tests becomes very important, very difficult to do, and that's going to take a lot of time. Tom, Bruce. that was a, a, a treat for this entranced audience. Uh, all you would have to do is have someone transcribe the videotape of this lecture uh, and you'd have a beautiful paper. If you haven't already done that, then I wish you would. Uh, you put it 
It's too long. So <laughs> you could leave out a couple of slides. And no, no. <laughs> Tom won't do that. Uh, Tom, we could uh, we could have a forum uh, about all of the issues and the excitement related to them uh, all night long. Uh, we have a group of uh, candidates that are going to go out to lunch, and I think they're too polite to get up and walk out. So if all of us would just join in congratulating you on that. Fantastic.